Hey everybody, I am John Barker, and in this video, we're gonna take a look at the all new ATEM Mini Pro ISO from Blackmagic Design. The brand new in the ATEM Mini lineup. You can see it here on the table. I'm gonna take a look at what's new in this device and actually gonna use it to produce some of this video as well, just so I can uh, get used to the workflow as well. In the interest of full disclosure, Blackmagic has sent the device over to the channel for a review, but once uh, some videos are made about it, we'll send it back to them. And uh, I just wanna thank them for sending it my way. And they're not watching this video before it's posted or anything like that. So first up, the A10 Mini Pro ISO has all the great features of the A10 Mini and the A10 Mini Pro. It has live streaming built in. Um, you can record, you have all the same buttons, the um, audio uh, features, the picture in picture, uh, the transition, all that good stuff is all the same as the A10 Mini and the A10 Mini Pro. Um, so nothing has changed too much in terms of form factor, connections on the back, or anything like that. It's very familiar if you've already used one of those devices. But what this model does bring is the addition of ISO recordings for all of your inputs. Now I've connected uh, cameras to one and two here, and I've also connected my computer source to three, and you can see it there. I'll show off some stuff later. Um, but the isolation control and recording of each of these uh, inputs is happening right now on the disc. Um, that means that I can later on edit the show, change things, um, make some edits better, take away some mistakes I made, and uh, tighten up things. So, for example, I'm shooting this whole thing um, on the ISO right now, but later I'm able to chop it all apart and uh, re-edit it the way I want it to be edited. So let's talk about the recording ISO feature. Well, the first step is to connect the drive, which I've already done, and I've also started recording because I wanted to shoot this video on the ATEM Mini Pro ISO. And then over on the computer, I can show you just a quick little feature that you need to make sure that you um, check in the record stream tab. You wanna make sure you uh, check this ISO record all inputs, and that way you'll be ma making sure that you ISO record all the inputs. Otherwise, you, um, you might forget to grab one of the sources and uh, the whole thing just falls apart if you don't ISO record the sources. So a very important box to check. The next step is to take a look in the live stream options where you set the quality. Now, interestingly, this is not the quality for all of the ISOs, but just for your, uh, your main program recording, the one that you're making on the ATEM Mini Pro ISO. And here I have it set to HyperDeck High because I wanted a nice high recording. And um, all of the other sources are also being recorded at HyperDeck High. Now, if I recorded something lower, like streaming low, my program would be recorded in streaming low, but the ISOs would still be recorded at that nice high HyperDeck high uh, recording, which is really great. It means that you can edit later and get a much better um, recording um, to post after the show. But whenever you want to live stream, you could stream at really low setting just in case your internet's not up for it. Uh, super good feature with the ITEM Mini Pro ISO. So just to show off a few things here, I'm going to edit around some of the shots. Um, what I can also do is turn on my uh, graphics as well. So I have them here running, and you can see them on the screen. Obviously, this is baked into the final recording and streaming, but it's something that I can uh, change later in the edit. So just turn that off again, and uh, back to the computer, just edit around a little, and then we can take a look at this in a minute in DaVinci Resolve. So I've stopped recording on the uh, ATEM Mini Pro ISO. I've grabbed all the footage and thrown it onto my computer. And here you can see the folder structure that comes from that recording. So I have my audio files. Uh, let's just pop in there and you can see I have audio for each of the cameras plus the two mics. Going back, I have my DaVinci Resolve file, untitled, I didn't name that very well. I have my program recording, which is the one that was um, the whole uh, recording of the whole show that I just did there. And then I have my video ISO files. And you can see here that um, I had nothing connected to input number four, but yet it still gave me a recording for the whole, um, the whole thing. So it's just a black recording. But I mean, it's probably a pretty tiny file. Let's have a look. Yeah, 23 megs. So that didn't matter so much. Um, but if I just pop out, I can see here on the info of the main recording, which was uh, yeah, almost six gigabytes. And then popping into the ISO files, I can see what size those were. And um, there's a little bit more actually. So you can see that the, the recording is 
around the same as the HyperDeck um, HyperDeck High setting that I have on there. Um, if I recorded in low, I would still have a really high quality recording of all the cameras, even of that uh, black one there. Um, input number three was actually my um, computer, and later you can see here was the, the graphics source as well. Just saw it for a second there. Yeah, there it is. So um, everything is coming in as expected, which is really great. But even cooler is this uh, resolve file, which we can open up now. Take a little look at and see what it looks like inside. Now this is something that I tried to do myself <sighs> called H2R Logger, which would be um, the same-ish idea. It would listen to the ATEM for commands and then create a log file, or you could just create a log file through it. You can still check it out and give it a try. But the deep integration with the ATEM, all the cameras, the ISO recordings, and uh, building that DaVinci Re Resolve file just makes this such a good workflow that it, um, it's a real killer for my H2R logger file, but it's uh, really fixed a lot of issues that um, I would have loved to have. And the reason I made the whole logger um, application is to solve all of these exact issues. Quick editing and on the job, I can easily make things happen. But with uh, this new Pro ISO, it's really changed the way I look to work in the future as well. So Resolve has opened up and now I can see my full project here, um, fully edited. Uh, this is this is really crazy how fast and easy this actually worked. Um, but I can see all my edit points are working nicely. I can you know trim them and change them and re-edit as I see fit. Something that I will do later um, to actually edit this actual video. Uh, I'm getting a little bit inception here because I just shot this and now I'm filming a video about it. Uh, over on the side, I can see all of my um, my master bin. I have my ISO stuff. So in here, you can see um, I actually used. Uh, this thumbnail was in my media player. I don't know if I actually cut to it during that production, but it was in there, so it managed to bring it in, and it's part of the um, Resolve project if I need it. And then I have all my cameras individually, um, just in case I need to grab anything in particular from them. Yeah, camera four was nothing. So let's see, a different camera here. Oh, camera three um, was just the computer all the individual ISOs sitting there, and then um, back to the master bin, I have that timeline built up. So one thing I did spot whenever you bring in the re-edited version is, uh, for example, when I showed those graphics on the downstream keyer earlier in the video, you could see the timer was above my head. But here in Resolve, when I play back that exact point, you can see that when I cut away, the downstream keyer doesn't make it onto the um, final production. So something you'd have to do is add those graphics in again, or maybe you didn't want the graphics in for the re-edited version. In that case, uh, let's say you had a logo in the top corner during your stream, but um, you don't want that in the final video, or it was the wrong logo and you want to make a change, then you'll find that when you open up the Resolve project, those things aren't necessarily right there anyway, so you will want to change them, re-add them, or remove them yourself. It works pretty well that way. One thing I'm really keen to see is if this all works with Final Cut Pro, now I have uh, thrown in the file to resolve here, you can see it, and I've selected the, uh, the timeline, and if I choose, um, where is it, export AAF slash XML, and in here I'll choose, um, let's just grab the latest version, 1.8 of FCP XML, and I'll just save that into my, um, my folder here. I can just navigate to that folder real quickly and find that file. Um, here it is, untitled, again, not very well named, but let me just open that up in Final Cut Pro and uh, see how easy it is to go from DaVinci Resolve to Final Cut Pro. So here's Final Cut Pro opened with uh, the untitled Resolve project. Double click to open that and I can see things are looking pretty good actually. Um, I have my edits all in place and it's all working very nicely. I can see here that all my edits are in place and I can um, make changes as I see fit, uh, re-edit everything, remove stuff, whatever I want to do inside of Final Cut Pro. Now one thing to keep in mind is that you are recording up to five streams of video at the same time, which, uh, which means a lot of data. Um, in my case, if I take a look at the whole folder that just got outputted, it was 30 gigabytes in total where this file here was about six gigabytes. So before I would have had um, plenty of space on my device to record uh, one 
whole one hour of production maybe, but for now, because I want to do this uh, ISO recordings, it's going to take up a lot more room, so uh, be ready to clear your drives a bit more often if you want to go for the Pro ISO route instead of the ATEM Mini Pro. Let's take a look at a few use cases that might be useful for the ATEM Mini Pro ISO. For my usage, I would have used this at conferences and meetups where I didn't want to bring too much gear, but I wanted that editability afterwards. Uh, grabbing footage from all different cameras and bringing it onto your computer, resyncing. It's not really a fun experience, but with everything in one place on the, on the same hard drive, it really helps out with uh, the speed of re-editing shows and re-editing conferences, especially whenever you want to produce on the same day and upload on the same evening, for example. And whenever you're offloading from cards and all that stuff, uh, it can get pretty hard and intensive to do that kind of work. But with the DaVinci Resolve, uh, already ready to go, this really speeds up that whole process. Another good use case is uh, videos like this where I'm producing on the fly here for a YouTube video. This is not being live streamed or anything like that, but I wanted to have full control over all of the inputs and I can change things later. So it's perfect for this kind of video where I can show off a device, tapping around, and then later I can edit all that footage together in the way I want it to be. Or else maybe I got it right at the time and I don't have to re-edit anything. And another good use case is when you have a low internet bandwidth, but you really want to produce a high quality final output. So you can stream at a pretty low setting, and then later you can upload a really high quality version and grab all the sources from cameras. So for example, if you shoot everything in 1080 on the ATEM Mini Pro ISO, later you can grab 4K from your cameras and uh, really easily slice all that in the DaVinci Resolve and get a 4K master output that you can throw on YouTube later or whatever way you want to host the video. So it's a really good use case for something like this. In terms of the cons for the device, I mean, it's kind of the same as the previous devices as well, where um, you, know, you don't have any control over what these buttons do. Uh, maybe you want some macro buttons instead, things like that that I've mentioned before in previous videos about the ATEM Mini and the ATEM Mini Pro. Uh, there's not really many cons other than that. Uh, the device itself is the size it is and the buttons are printed and those are the buttons that they are. There's not much we can do about that. I like to add a companion uh, stream deck on the side and then add macros to that if I really need them. So, uh, I mean, in terms of cons, except for maybe the, the price of the device, um, there's not really many downsides about going for something like this uh, over maybe the ATEM Mini Pro or the ATEM Mini. If you know which one you want and the features you want, then it's worth probably stepping up to the ISO if you really need that ISO recording. Otherwise, if you just want to do streaming and recording, then stick with the ATEM Mini Pro, I think. And that just leaves pricing on the device, which is coming in around the $900 region, which seems quite high for uh, the ATEM Mini, since the ATEM Mini originally is quite an inexpensive device. But with all the features packed into this, it's, um, it kind of makes sense why it's at that price range. And it is hard to compare it to something like the ATEM Television Studio HD, which is 100 or 200 more dollars. Um, that has eight inputs that have way more outputs, but this thing has better audio control, it has scalers and all the inputs, um, so it makes it really difficult to compare it to any of the current ATEM lines. The only thing directly comparable to it is the ATEM Mini Pro, which uh, doesn't have that isolation um, recordings, so it kind of makes sense why this is a little bit of a step up from the previous one. Obviously it's doing a lot of work to get those up to five streams of recording going at the same time, so um, a lot of features has been packed into this tiny little device. So that's a look at the ATEM Mini Pro ISO. Let me know if you have uh, anything you want me to test or check out before I have to send it back to Blackmagic. But otherwise, it's been fun to give it a go. It's been really great to open up DaVinci Resolve projects and see how easy it is to re-edit these things. And um, I've really enjoyed it already. I look forward to making some more videos about it, streaming with it, maybe trying to replace with 4K content and all that good stuff. And otherwise, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.